Well, where's the, where's the appropriate place to begin with the Heidelberg Catechism? Uh, but to questions number one and two. So please turn in the back of your hymnals to page 872. Uh, that is Lord Day, Lord's Day number one, which uh, uh, embraces questions one and two. I will read the dark print question. You can answer in the finer print with the answer. And uh, before I read this, I just want to give out an encouraging word that everyone, every single one in this church, young and old, should memorize Heidelberg Catechism question number one. You know why? Because of what it says. It will bring you comfort. And if you don't need comfort, well, forget about it. <laughs> but I think you do. So please, take out that time to memorize it, and then go harass another brother or sister in the Lord, <laughs> and buttonhole them and ask them, how are you doing? Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I want to hear it. I love to hear it. And let's, let's do that together. I, I think that's a, a very appropriate thing for, for this church, don't you? Yes. Good. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And then question number two is right to the right of that uh, question, question number two. Uh, how many things must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three, first, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am delivered from all my sins and misery. Third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. Let us pray. Oh, wait. Man, man, man. No, let us not pray. But soon we will pray. First, we will read Scripture. And so notice the Scripture passages before you. Uh, one that uh, you might think, will he ever let this go? And uh, the answer is no. And that's Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 through 21. We learned uh, repeatedly of the uh, Proto-Evangelium. Back to back with the great fall of man as the great rescue of man in Genesis 3, 15 through 21. God comes to Adam and Eve, the fallen couple, and he says to them, I will put enmity between you uh, and the woman, says to the devil, that is, between you, the devil, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So there Adam was told not only had he died spiritually, but now he can also expect to die physically. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Now, the next passage to read is Ezekiel 36. 
Ezekiel, of course, is the prophet of the exile, uh, looking to a day of a new covenant and of a return from exile. And this he speaks of here in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So there's the change of heart from disobedience and hardness to softness and submission in obedience. That's the great promise of the new covenant. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And then Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, 2 through 14, this is the great redemptive triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, redemptive text. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 3. I want to start with verse 3, not 2. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 3, sorry. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him, that is Christ, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So you have the triune God of grace redeeming us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to the praise of his glory. And then the result of that is in Colossians chapter 3, the outcome of how that comes out, or you might say flows out of the redeemed life. Colossians 3, 15 through 17. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Very encouraging text of grace. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do ask now, Lord, as we consider these wonderful truths of your word, that your Holy Spirit would afresh not only illumine our minds, but enable us, Lord, to draw out of Christ a redemptive comfort for our aching souls. 
And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, uh, the first service is service of expositional preaching. We're going through John, and the second is doctrinal preaching uh, through uh, the Heidelberg Catechism. And that way you get a full diet of the Word, whether it's through the lay of the land or focusing in upon a particular portion of that uh, land. And uh, that way uh, they are complementary uh, to uh, each other. And hopefully that with both uh, angles, expositional or doctrinal, uh, you are given the Word of God in such a way that your faith in Jesus Christ is fed and fueled because that's uh, the purpose of preaching, according to Romans 10. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, by the one uh, sent and ordained uh, for that very purpose. So the Bible puts very, very high priority upon believing in Jesus and listening uh, to His preached Word. But uh, just don't Take it from me. Uh, keep your finger in the text. And so your reference is not your pastor, ultimately. He's just an instrument to assist. But your reference is in the text of the Word of God. And so we come now uh, to be faced with this very simple question. And that is, why do you need comfort? Uh, that's how the uh, Heidelberg Catechism starts. What is your only comfort? But it doesn't say why you need comfort. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, isn't it? So we should stop a little bit and ask ourselves, why do I need comfort in my life? And the reason I need comfort is because of two words. Those two words are this. I am a miserable sinner. Uh, that, that is how you uh, uh, pack churches out to be very large and growing, by continually reminding everyone there that uh, you are miserable sinners. B.B. Uh, Warfield, the great theologian of Princeton Seminary, said that this was the issue that was so offensive to so many people about the Christian message, is they did not like the fact that Christianity is miserable sinner preaching. They don't like that. But you know something? You're not going to get to the comfort for being a miserable sinner if you don't admit you're a miserable sinner and you need comfort. Because if you don't start there, the comfort you get is going to be what? Yeah. It's going to be a chicken soup for the soul, they call it. Very thin and watery stuff that does not satisfy true, self-recognized, miserable sinners. And you might say to yourself, all right, I will go ahead and adopt that I'm a miserable sinner. But it's not my fault. Because even the Bible said that, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, that sin came into the world through one man, Adam. And we read about it a little bit, didn't we? So you might want to be able to say, well, look, this disease I have of being a miserable sinner, I caught it from somebody else. Not my fault. But what you must understand is Adam is you. And you are Adam. You may not like that. You may think, oh, I could go back to the garden and do a better job. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, God says you're Adam. And Adam is you. And you were in Adam in a very fundamental way 
so that when Adam and Eve partook of that fruit, you were there along with them partaking, and thus their guilt is your guilt. Their sin is your sin. And therefore, you're a miserable sinner. And it was someone else's fault. But it was also your fault. Because that someone else was you. And in your place. And so recognizing that fact that we are miserable sinners... And miserable sinners mean that we are stuck on ourselves deeply and that we love ourselves deeply and we are the number one uno priority of all things. What I like and don't like are the the things that really matter in life. And the, the fact that all of this is an idolatrous fallen posture toward God and puts me at odds with God and means that I'm enslaved to the devil who tricked me in the first place and I'm headed to hell renders me this miserable sinner. But where can I find comfort? And before we jump and leap right into what the Heidelberg Catechism says, let's consider for a moment what many grasp for, for comfort. Superficial, false comforts. Well, one of the great comforts of this day and age for sinners is called the comfort of self-medication. And there's quite an array of various medications that function that way in world in this world to bring comfort to the fact that you're a fallen, miserable sinner. And one of those is southern comfort. And you'll notice in the sermon today that this sermon title is not southern comfort. It is southern, northern, eastern, and western comfort. You know, you might say, well, that's kind of, you know, goofy for a pastor to make a play on words like that. But I remind you of the Apostle Paul, who said, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. He so boldly made that contrast. And so today I make that bold contrast that you may go after comfort, the comfort of the bottle or many bottles or comfort of some type of uh, anesthesia of drugs, whether they be up with meth or down with heroin. But all those comforts are comforts that are seeking to medicate the fundamental fact that you are a miserable sinner and you need comfort And that is an idol that you're using to comfort yourself with. And it will not reach to the depth of the marrow of your bones that rattle with misery. There are other efforts at comfort. Immorality. A good, sensuous feeling of comfort. Or to plunge yourself into absorbing work so you just don't have to think about it. Let's not think about it. Let me just absorb myself and work. And when I get this work done, it gives me a good feeling. Look what I got done. And look how hard I went. You know, feel, I can feel the, the, the uh, calluses on my hands. There's comfort there. Or the comfort of achievement in one way or another. I've achieved this, I've achieved that, I've accomplished this, I've accomplished that. Is there comfort now for me? And certainly achievement in life. Certainly a good day of hard work. God has made us to be able to look back upon and have a sense of enjoyment. But not comfort for your soul. Because when those creaturely things occupy the Creator within your soul, those things which are nice gifts from the giver now function as the giver himself and function as idols in their place. Another great comfort is the comfort that religion provides. Religion. 
religion that enables you to do certain things and act in certain ways and have certain levels of conformity and effort to be a good person in life, to be sincere and to do your best, plasters over the reality that underneath the lid of the religious veneer is a whole box full of snakes and scorpions and spiders. No, they will not run deep to bring the comfort you need. Now, even though there are all these superficial false comforts for miserable sinners, God has not left you to go wandering about from one superficial comfort to another throughout your lifetime so you can say, I've tried it all, I've done it all, and I've sensed it all, and at the end of it all, I'm just as miserable as I started. God has not left you to that course. No, God has sent into the world true comfort. Even as Isaiah says, comfort Comfort my people, sinning people laying under the reality of the curse, self-conscious that they have sinned against God, they're guilty before Him, they're far away from Him. God comes, and I love the words that are used, He tenderly speaks to Jerusalem. This is God coming, this is the love of God coming to speak His words of comfort to the the miserable sinner. And what are those comforting words? Well, we find them in the Heidelberg Catechism. Question, what is your only comfort in life and in death that I'm not my own, but belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ? And here it is. Here's how he is your faithful Savior. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. I love that picture in Dangerous Journey. Um, uh, as soon as you walk into the book nook, you look in your left, there's a copy of Dangerous Journey. It's a child's picture and text, broken down very briefly, of Pilgrim's Progress. And in Jane Dangerous Journey, you have Pilgrim who's got that big burden on his back. He's a miserable sinner. He's trying to figure out how to get it off, right? But finally, he comes to the cross of Jesus Christ, and what happens? He looks to the cross, and that big burden he's carrying rolls off his chest down into the tomb. And it says, and, he, and, and, and the picture there is he's jumping up with brand new clothes on, and he's joyous, praising God. Why? Because he's found comfort. As the Heidelberg Catechism says, Christ, he has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. Imagine if the picture was, well, Christ took three quarters of the burden. No, 90% of the burden, but the last 10% you've got to kind of still work out and get off your back. That's the gospel that's often preached today. Jesus did so much, now you've got to do so much. But that's the problem, isn't it? I'm still the same sinner I was over here, and I've got to do something. No, he has fully paid for all your sins with his precious blood. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. This is the picture of Christ when God clothed Adam and Eve with the garments of those animals. But first, he had to kill those animals. Those animals are a picture of the shed blood of Jesus. Jesus dying for our forgiveness and those Skins of those animals is a picture of Christ's righteousness clothing us. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. The day of wrath is gone. The day of comfort and grace and reconciliation with the holy God of heaven has come uh, by Jesus Christ. He does something awesome when he died on the cross. His shed blood cleanses us and claims us for forgiveness and his righteousness clothes our nakedness before God. 
Uh, he is a faithful Savior that brings us all the way in. The great comfort that it doesn't end there. Christ is not only the cleanser, He's not only the clothier in His own righteousness, He is also the crusher. And He has delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. Christ did what Adam, the first Adam, did not do. Dispatched, defeated, and crushed the devil. Even at the cross is the place where he crushed him, which is Genesis 3.15 tells us. You will bruise him on the heel. Yeah, you're going to get your fangs in him. But he will crush you on the head. His is definitive. Yours is lethal, but his is definitive. Your head is crushed. You are conquered by the king who bears the crown of thorns. He crushes, he defeats the devil. And these great blessings, these great comforts, God comes and tenderly says to you in Jesus Christ, look, I know we're at odds with each other. I know that you're filled with guilt. I know you're a miserable sinner deserving to be on your way to hell. That's where you should go. But listen to me. I speak tenderly to you. I speak lovingly to you. Come and trust in my Son by faith. By Christ alone, by grace alone, that is what God has done, by faith alone. Trust in Him. Blessed, Jesus says, are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the one who comes. I have nothing but need and emptiness. I trust in Christ who has fully, not partially, fully paid for my sins and released me from the tyranny of the devil. Two great comforts. But the Heidelberg doesn't stop there with those comforts. Not only has Christ redeemed me, and delivered me from the tyranny of the devil, but also in the very beginning. He does that in such a way that as the Heidelberg opens up, it's I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and death to Christ. Why? Why do I belong to Christ? Why, why am I no longer belonging to me? Because he has redeemed me for himself. That's why. He has claimed me, as 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, Paul says, the love of Christ controls us or constrains us or gets a hold of us in such a way that it begins to direct our lives. That's the message of the gospel. The love of God for my soul directing me now in a new way. A love that says, I don't belong to me anymore. That was my problem. That's the core of my problem as a miserable sinner. Thinking it was my life, I belong to me, I do what I want, I do this desire, I do that desire, chase after this, chase after that. No, no longer. I belong to Him. He's bought and paid for me. He's bought and paid for me, not that He would abuse me like the devil. He bought and paid for me that He might love me and speak to me tenderly and deliver me and bring me into a sweet communion with Himself. That's the third great comfort. I'm not my own anymore. I don't live for me anymore. I belong to Christ. I'm His project now. It's not my life and what I do with it. You know, you've heard the saying, you know, you're going you're to re-identify yourself, remake yourself. No, that program's over. You belong to Christ. You're His project. And His project is a project of His grace, of claiming you in such a way that you have a love relationship with Him. Claiming you in such a way that what you used to be, you aren't anymore. You're a new creation. Little sniveling, self-centered, insecure self is out. A new one's in. The one that walks with their head up knowing they're loved by Christ and love Him and His rule and reign is what's functional in your life. And that means repentance, doesn't it? Repentance is, that's what repentance is, really. I don't belong to me anymore, I belong to you. I'm going this way, doing my thing, now I want to belong to you and let you direct my life, Lord. 
Because I, I belong to you. But there's another comfort, even beyond that comfort of knowing I belong to him in the bonds of the new covenant. And the Heidelberg so wonderfully brings that out. He also, he also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. You see, you, you, you step back into the world when you become a believer in Jesus Christ with a new outlook. The world's a scary place. The world is a scary place for so many reasons. I had a friend of mine once, he was in his 20s, walking down the street, minding his own business, not meaning anybody any harm. Truck came around the corner, had one of those big crashing balls for tearing down buildings. Well, as, the car, as that truck swung around the corner, that ball somehow got, got some line on it and began to swing out. And guess who got hit? Right in the head, my friend. Dead on the spot. It was over. You don't know what's going to happen in your life in this world. You know, people who kind of withdraw in and they're all concerned and afraid and protecting. and There's some reasonableness to that, okay? But if you're a child of God, you come to Christ. You walk right out into the minefield of this world and you say, what? Not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. And if it's God's will that I can be struck by a big ball of iron today, so be it. All that is is graduation day. <laughs> All that is is translation from this arena to a far better place. And so that great comfort in life for the people of God for the believer in Jesus Christ, as I step out into this precarious world and all of its problems and its uncertainty and the precariousness of what will happen next is that God, my Father, is in control. Not a hair can fall from my head. Now, if you're kind of weak in that area, I have a doctor's prescription for you. You can write this down. It's called Calvin's Institutes, 1541 edition, chapter 8. The Predestination and Providence of God. Read it. It will comfort your soul if you're a child of God. The Shorter Catechism says that everything that comes to pass comes to pass by God's decree. And guess what? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that God who brings everything to pass is your Father who's doting on your life. <laughs> you talk about stepping out into the world with confidence. Brothers and sisters, there it is. There's comfort. There's comfort. But it's not the end of the comfort. There's one other little bit of comfort here that we don't want to leave out. And that's that last paragraph. There's three paragraphs. You notice that? Three paragraphs here. And that last one is, Because I belong to Him, Christ by His Holy Spirit also assures me of eternal life. Because I belong to Christ, He gives me the Holy Spirit that gives me the confidence that I belong to Him. And you need that confidence that I belong to Him. And the Holy Spirit, Paul says in Romans 8, 16, bears witness to your spirit that you are a child of God. Ephesians chapter 1 that I read just a moment ago, verses 13 and 14, tells us that the Holy Spirit is a seal if you are a believer in Jesus Christ that you have a down payment, 
a deposit of the future inheritance to come. If I came to you and I said, hey, look, I've got $1,000 I'm going to give you at the end of the year. You'd, <laughs> that's just preaching. You don't mean that. I say, no, really, I'm going to give you $1,000 at the end of this year, a Christmas present from me. And some, some, I said, look, I can tell you're struggling with this. Here's a $100 bill right now. The other $900 you're going to get on Christmas. What do you think? Where, where will your confidence be at about this big promise of, yeah, my pastor's going to be $1,000 on Christmas. Where's your confidence going to be at if I hand you a $100 bill right now? It just really went up, didn't it? Well, Paul says the Holy Spirit is a down payment, a deposit, and functional guarantee that the rest is on its way. In other words, the great inheritance of the people of God is heaven. It's the promised land. And the Holy Spirit is given to you who belong to Christ that you may have the confidence and be assured that you belong to Him and that the rest is on its way. And not only so, but the Holy Spirit does something else. There's a second thing here that Heidelberg says that the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer. He assures me of eternal life. There's no greater assurance in life than that, is, is there? There's one Puritan that wrote a book on assurance. You know what he called it? He called that book on assurance, Heaven on Earth. That's the name of the book. Heaven on Earth. I think it was Thomas Brooks. Thomas Boston. One of those guys. Heaven on Earth. Assurance. That's exactly what it is. Because what is the Holy Spirit? It's heaven on earth. The Spirit sent from heaven. It's a down payment of the world to come. But the second thing the Holy Spirit does is not only assures me, but notice what Heidelberg says, it makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to what? Live for Him. You see, isn't that beautiful? It's not like God says, okay, I'm going to save you. Now, you live for me from now on. Okay, I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> you know, it's, called, it's called, you know, being freed from the law, going back to the law as the modus operandi of the Christian life, right? <laughs> no, he gives the Holy Spirit, and what does the Spirit do? That's God, the third person of the Trinity, the down payment of heaven, causes us, makes us wholeheartedly willing. I want to do it. I want to do it. Because the Holy Spirit, what? Romans chapter 5, verse 5, the Holy Spirit does what? It pours the love of God, the love of Christ into my heart. And in doing that, I want to do it. I want to please Him with my life. I want to do those things that honor and please and glorify God. He makes me willing and ready from now on to live for Him. It's a wonderful thing, brothers and sisters, as we close out each day of our lives, be able to get up the next day with the great temptation of Satan coming to you and saying, you're not a very good Christian. What did you, you say that for? And I, I remember just, I just said something the other day. I said, what did I say that for? I'm glad you don't know what it is. But I said, what did I say that for? It's pretty awful. But I can get up every day, you know, when you get up the new day, you say, Lord, it's a new day. Your blood is washed away yesterday. And I've asked forgiveness from you and from any appropriate other people that I need to, all right? And now, Lord, you've made me wholeheartedly willing and ready. Lord, I may be and face down in the mud by noon, but you've made me willing and ready. So let's take this on. You're not going to let go of me. You've claimed me. You've made me yours. So let's go. Not by my strength. I have none. But by your strength. You are the one. By the Holy Spirit that's working this readiness and this desire and this longing 
that knowing I'm headed to the day when I will be with Christ forever. And I want today to count. And as R.C. Spoll, God rest his soul, used to say, right now counts forever. That's what the Holy Spirit does in us. I want right now to count forever. If you have that in your heart, that's the Holy Spirit working in you. Comforting you that you are Christ because that's the Christ-like attitude, that desire. And all these comforts, the comfort of being cleansed and clothed by Christ, the comfort of Christ crushing the devil on your behalf, the comfort that he claims you as his own, the comfort that the world in which you live is a world under the sovereign control of, your, of, the, of, of God's providence in your life, the comfort that the Spirit assures you you belong to Jesus and, and works in you to make you wholeheartedly willing and ready, all these comforts are all of triune grace. They come to the undeserving, miserable, hell-bound sinner and to no one else because no one else needs it or wants it. But they who long for it and know they need that comfort, they find it by the triune grace of God, the grace of the Father in sovereign election, the grace of the Son in shedding His blood in redemption, and the grace of the Holy Spirit coming into your life. What do you need to know to live and die in this comfort? Question number two asks, how many things do you need to know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Well, you need three things. And these three things outline the whole Heidelberg Catechism for you. Those Heidelberg Catechism has three parts. Guilt, grace, and gratitude. Those are the three things. You, 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 want to, you want to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Well, it starts with this. Number one, huh? didn't know how great my sin and misery are. You know, when Isaiah stepped in the temple in Isaiah chapter 6, he was probably having a pretty good day. Yeah, hey, I'm going to go down and worship the Lord with God's people. But guess what? His eyes were open. And you know what he realized? God is holy, and I am a trash can. I'm like that guy in Sesame Street, you know, that little grouchy guy in the trash can. That's me. I'm unclean. Now, did Isaiah get converted then? I don't think so. I think Isaiah had his eyes open. And if you live as a Christian in this world, you know, the Lord's going to show you things about yourself. You're going to wish, man, I wish I just could have remained blind. <laughs> That's hurts. <laughs> Realize I'm such a sinful man. But you might say that, that, that you, know, you might think that's a bad thing, but you know, that's a good thing. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7, even the Apostle Paul himself said, in my flesh, what? Dwells no good thing. <laughs> the Apostle Paul. It's good to know how great your sin and misery are because when you know how great your sin and misery are, what does it do? It brings you to Jesus Number two, how I am delivered from all my sin and misery. <laughs> it brings me back to Jesus. And the Christian life is not a life of babbling in foreign tongues. The Christian life is not a life of miracles left and right, oh boy. The Christian life is a life of understanding the depth of my depravity and sin and the height and greatness of the grace of God as He comes and rescues me, not only initially in conversion, but throughout my life until the final rescue occurs when He comes back in power and glory and I stand before Him, as Ephesians says, spotless and blameless no longer a miserable sinner at all. Brothers and sisters, that's how. That's how we live in the joy of this comfort. To come and hear that gospel, that gospel of grace and mercy to ring in our ears again. Grace and mercy for your soul streams from the throne of grace in Christ. And that's why we need the word preached to us. Because we need it put into us. We need it jammed into us. 
We need to put down our throats through preaching because what will happen is we won't say, why did you push that down my throat? You're going to say, wow, that's delicious. I want more. So the preaching brings the gospel, brings God's grace to you in Christ. He who you think opposes you, loves you and laid down his life for you and wants to restore you again and again and sustain you. And if that's not enough, he seals it. That same grace is sealed to your heart by bread and wine. And it's placed in your hand. It's because it's by grace. And the third one, how many things must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Is the third one. Well, okay. I see my guilt. I see the wonder of God's grace to me in Christ. It's fantastic. Unbelievable. It's more than I can possibly believe. How do I get from one to two? Well, you need God's grace. That's why he's got word and sacrament. Number three is then, how am I to thank God for such deliverance? How am I to thank God for such deliverance as this? Well, the answer to that question is a life of seeking to please Him. Life of obedience. In worship, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians 3, 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's worship. We come to hear the word, be filled with the word, and respond to the word, praising God for it, thanking God for it, singing him, singing to him. And verse 17 is a life of service. Worship and service. Whatever you do, after you're done singing and praising God, receiving his word and being filled with it, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I'm going out that door and I want to do everything else in the name of Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do, do it in Christ's name. Giving thanks to God the Father, the Father who is your Father, who controls all people and all problems by His providence. That's right. All people and all problems are controlled by your Father, by His providence. And thus, so Paul says, give thanks in all things. Give thanks in all things. And that means that the end brings us back to the beginning. The Holy Spirit working in our hearts to give thanks to God in worship, give thanks to God in service in this world, to the Father through Jesus Christ. Our faithful Savior, He was fully paid for all our sins with his precious blood and has set us free from the tyranny of the devil. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you.